Okay, welcome to another Renew case study. Um, this is a really great case. I really think this is a good one because uh, it entails a lot of things. It's got a lot of good things and interesting things going on here. Multiple ideas around a treatment plan from general dentistry to advanced general dentistry. Um, and they all come into play here. When you look at this case here, we're really only going to talk about the upper arch. There's not much to talk about there, even though there's some spacings here, maybe some periodontal issues, the root canal treated tooth, um, and maybe a cavity on one or two. We're not going to talk about the lower arch. We're only talking about the upper arch and the interest in that. And there's a lot to learn about this case. Now, if you haven't noticed yet, this is... Um, an interesting case because she's missing bilaterally on both sides the pr entire primary chewing area that I've been talking so much about in a lot of the other videos in the concept of what really matters. The three, the three teeth that are the primary chewing area, the first premolar, the second premolar, and the first molar. Those matter all the time, and the sweet spot is that second premolar. So she's missing that between here. And this is the way I explain it to patients all the time, is that this is that primary chewing area here, and these then became the cutting or smiling teeth, right? Uh, canine to canine. And then we go back to the primary chewing area and she has just eliminated that bulk here. Now, if you also have watched some of the videos and look, know what my assessment is about, the other thing you're really going to notice is the ridge has changed here, and that is right here. You can see how that arcs. So her ridge for an upper arch is how this is limited. You don't always see that. But that's what's occurred here, and the sinus comes down quite a bit through here. So the sinus is this line here, and the sinus is this line here, and then you have a little bit of ridge resorption here, and you have more ridge resorption here. Now, was that due to extraction, bone morphing, all that stuff? Yeah, yes and no. What happens here um, is also she wears a partial denture, and... Um, it's not a very good uh, tooth supportive partial denture, which means there's too much pressure on the, the partial denture pushing that partial denture up. And here's where you see maybe a little uh, something going on here. This is starting to match this, and it dips down for this tooth here. Uh, it kind of offsets the occlusion uh, plane a little bit here. But when you have a partial denture that's not tooth-borne and it's tissue-borne, it's going to push on the tissue here, causing more bone to resorb, in this case, in the upward manner, but mostly it always affects the bottom. So whenever I see a case where somebody has a lower partial denture that's just tissue-borne, not on not hanging on a tooth and, and resting on a tooth then cause a lot of resorption. Here is an interesting one because I don't typically see this, but with her partial denture, it was resting on the gum tissue. I don't know why they didn't make it uh, tooth borne, which means that the partial denture actually rests right here as a little rest seat there. Um, it might be because you can't really put a rest seat on the canine. And so, I don't know what happened, but it's just totally tissue-borne between here. You can put a little rest seat on the tongue side of the canine, but it doesn't help that much in keeping the pressure off of here. Here was a tooth-borne situation, so it had a little limiting factor, but still had occurred a little bit, possibly because this moves up and down and didn't fit all that well. So, that is some of the issue going on here. Now... Here is the sinus. So the question mark is, is what could we do here? We can do a number of things. You can replace three teeth with two implants. Or you can replace three teeth with three implants. So if we did three implants 
and three implants, then we have a cost of six implants, six abutments, and six crowns. If you do it that way, the question mark then becomes, do you want to splint them together or do you want to keep them as individual teeth? That all depends on the size of the implant that you want to put in. As you can see, the bone is thicker here or thicker here in that first premolar position, but as you go back, you start limiting your amount of bone. And this is one of the weakest areas of bone you have in the jaw or upper and lower jaw areas. Same with here. So as you go back, you're starting to limit the amount of bone that you have for support of the bigger tooth area here, which has the bigger load. So my recommendation, unless you get a good, nice, wide implant back here, is to actually probably split them at least the second premolar to the first molar um, so we can get a little bit more of that support. Now you do risk the patient being able to clean that particular site, of course, but it's kind of a happy trade-off than everything failing as well due to uh, biomechanics. I would side over biomechanics failing before a hygienic event causes the implant to fail in this particular situation. So that's how I would judge that. Um, so let's look at the site here. And if we look, let's start in the uh, first molar position, which would be about right here. And you can see that there really is not much bone. And if we're going to go measure that, we are looking at about five millimeters or so. So just under five millimeters here. Now that's enough bone to secure an implant there. Um, so here's where we would want to do some sort of vertical sinus lift. You can do three more millimeters of bone material there and um, create an eight millimeter segment here. Um, I developed this technique that I call, and maybe other people do it too, I call it a double bump technique, or we call it sinus secure in our office. And what that means is I will do a vertical bone lift here, and I will take it to about, let's say there. So I will graft to about this height. And what that does, it starts to heal to about an eight millimeter site. So if you do it this way, you're looking at a two bone healing event. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do that. What you could do is uh, take the implant and let's find an implant here. And let's do a five by eight. So there's my five by eight. So you could do the implant and place the graft at the same time. Now that means it's at least one bone healing event. Sometimes I add about two, three more weeks to allow that bone to hold more properly heal. What's really great about this case is she's got a lot of nice bone. All of that bone with the graft material is going to grow bone a lot faster in that sinus area and secure that implant in. So this is a methodology to do. This is one way. And that means that that graft material needs to come up to here. So it looks like it's about a four millimeter distance, five millimeter distance of graft material. Takes a little time and expertise to get that vertical sinus lift there. If you do the hydraulic lift method, same idea. Um, and you should be able to get that nicely elevated and through. It's a nice sinus situation. This is a very good case if you've never done any sinus elevations before um, because this is about as straightforward as you can get. Um, and you can secure that implant into more than four millimeters of bone, which is great. Um, and you will, and you can have, you have a nice wide ridge, so you get a nice wide implant. And that's what it would look like here. So that looks pretty good. So I wouldn't be too shy of putting a single tooth on there, uh, given if we did two other implants. If you do a two implant bridge system, then you've got to connect that. That's not a bad idea either. So 
Looking back at this one, I was mentioning something about the sign secure method. So let's do something here. This is another way to do it. It takes a little longer. It takes another boning event. But let's say we grafted uh, this site. We made a 3 millimeter osteotomy. We're going to go to a 5 in the future. But let's do a 3 millimeter osteotomy. And we tent this up because we only have so much access with our tools. But we tent this up, and we put some graft material in there. Now we have an 8 millimeter height between the crest of the bone and that thing. So after the first bone healing event, you take a CT, you look at that height. Now what could you do with it? Well, why I call it a double bump technique is that we're going to now take this and elevate it even higher up here when we put the implant in. So now let's put another implant in. And we're going to pick a 5 by 10. So I'm going to say OK. And we're going to put a 5 by 10. Let's take a look at that. So now, if you remember, we have bone at the top of that line. And it's going to be like that. This is a lot easier to do clinically. So your bone originally that we put in the first amount was right here. We got now between here and here about seven, eight millimeters of bone that had a first bone healing event. So we know we have a lot of osteoblastic activity. We have a lot of fresh bone growing in here. Now when we do our osteotomy, we have about a, a good amount of mature bone, immature bone, and then we have this three millimeters that we're going to go up even further. So we do the second vertical sinus lift and we go all the way up here. And it's pretty easy to push it now. And you can now elevate that tissue even further. And you put a little more graft into that site and you bring it up to here. Now let's take a look at that. So now when you actually look at it in this case, it actually really looks great. I mean, you have a really nice solid implant in there, 5 by 10 on the molar. Um, and I feel, for some reason, I just feel that much more secure about the situation that we're going to get into. And let's say the patient wants to have a three-unit bridge. And now we're going to come into this side here. Let's get all these off. And that bone looks really good, but this is kind of a narrow implant. That's not very wide. Remember, she has a little bit of a constriction here. She got a little constriction here, so maybe she's a yellow to orange on the constriction. I would say orange. Um, but the bone quality is really good, so she gets a green for that. Let's put in an implant, and here's a pretty good one, but let's do uh, an 11.5 by 37 and that's what it looks like here. So I'm not crazy about how thick these walls are, but that's about as good as you're going to get. You can't do much about it here. You're going to have to do a little com more compression maybe that you would want, maybe a little less. It's hard to say. You kind of got to feel out the compressiveness uh, when you do it. So I would be looking at something like this. Um, uh, as a placement for her, you've got it down for the first premolar, the molar, and then you do a three-unit bridge right here. So that's that's solid. You're not going to have a problem with that. You're going to have a decently hygienic bridge so she can clean under it. Um, I wouldn't have any issues. This is going to take two bone healing events to get this done, in my opinion, to get the larger size implant in. You can, if you can, if you're able to add graft at a five, six, seven millimeter level, that's fine. But you now just doubled your healing event anyway. I personally would rather do a double sinus bump, making sure that we have mature bone while the implant goes in. I just feel that graft material around the implant that's healing is not as good as native bone healing around an implant. Um, so. Here we go. If we go on the other side, let's look at that. Okay. 
and bone quality is excellent here. We have a nice straighter ridge. It's not maybe now that's more of a yellow, but does it matter? Let's put an implant in. We can pick one easily the same size here. I always like picking the same sizes if we can on both sides of the arch. And Okay, so that would be there, and then now I'm going to pick another one over here. And because this case is so bilateral, uh, we're going to get the same probably situation on both sides. Let's take a look. Ah, this is a little bit more rounded, not as wide, so we're probably looking at about a 4.5, maybe a 4.2. Um, we've got a nice uh, amount of bone here. Looks about five millimeters. Let's measure that. Yeah, 5.4. And now let's pick an implant. And let's do a 4.2 by 10. And that would work out well, too. You could do maybe even a 4.5 here. I probably wouldn't go with the 5 unless I sunk it up higher, did more grafting. But the idea is there. This is still solid. It's not as wide as I like. That's a 5 in the molar area. That's a 4.2 to 4.5. But what we're going to do here is get her full chewing capacity back. We're going to get back the primary chewing area on both of those at an affordable cost, it's more affordable, we could also put the implants in here, that's going to add thousands of dollars more. Um, and what I recommend this patient to do first is to, if she's in limited funds, here's another thing I do, is say, well, these are more important than these, or you do the sinus bump here, and then you give the patient, so you do a sinus bump here and here, so that now you give the patient a good four months of healing, but also they have an ability to save up to then place the implant, and then they got to save up another four months to get the crown. So you got about eight months to a year, let's say. Uh, first you do the, the graft. Here, here. Nothing's changed. You let that heal. They come back. It's just, I don't like being a bank. I don't want to be a bank. I don't, I don't loan that way. People can't get credit cards from a bank. Why would I want to be the bank, right? So here's where the payment plan idea comes in and makes it affordable for the patient is to do segmented treatment planning for all of this advanced general dentistry that's going on here. Um, I would not recommend in this case, there's another possibility here that the patient could actually do, but I would really not recommend it, but I do see this happening. Uh, patients go to Mexico or, you know, some other dentist that really feels that they want to go a little gung-ho, they will use this tooth or this tooth and they'll do a five-unit bridge across from canine to molar. I would not recommend that from here to here. I also would not recommend doing an implant here or here and then putting a partial denture onto that. Um, I do see those as well that can work. It gets very complicated. And if you know one of my standard rules of keep it simple, um, that makes it more complicated. And that's kind of like the more dentistry is kind of worse dentistry. I don't think you're saving much by spending money on a partial denture, two implants and abutments, than four implants and two, three and a bridges. That should be very, um, you know, you should be at least two thirds of the way of the cost there. And if the patient can at least pay for two-thirds of it, then I would say let them save up for another year to get something that's really going to work for them a lifetime that's going to be fixed. Then some fancy partial denture that's going to be complicated and going to need a lot of maintenance down the road anyway. So, you know, there's a lot of scenarios with this case. I'm sure I'm missing a number of them. But you get the idea of what can make it affordable for the patient, what could be the simplest thing for the patient, how to train and plan that out. Given the nature of this case, this is a really great starter 
sinus case, vertical elevation, you know, sinus case. This is a great way to learn about restoring multiple teeth with implants, um, offering opportunities to patients that actually could work for them there, um, and realize that there's a limit to crown and bridge material there that we could do. So, all right. Thanks a lot.